Good evening, and thank you for joining us this evening for what will be a very interesting panel, I believe, um, as we launch tonight um, a report we've been working on that remembers um, a very difficult period in our history um, and, and one that is not quite over. Tonight, we'd like to talk about uh, family separation as it happens um, primarily to immigrant children, but we know it happens to children all the time. And we'll talk a little more about that. But tonight, we wanna talk about this report that remembers the zero tolerance policy admin uh, administered by the Trump administration um, in 2017 and 18, and the impact that had, as well as to meet our panelists who have worked directly with separated children across uh, various different parts of the country um, and can share with us some firsthand experiences about what that looked like and uh, what some of the real challenges still are today. As we know, uh, family separation is not over. It continues to happen both for immigrant children and for other children. Um, and we want to make sure that we keep the focus on the current day reality that um, requires our, our continued vigilance. Over two years ago, uh, the Trump administration began a policy, a pilot project, they piloted it first, where they thought they might be able to deter the number of uh, people coming to our border seeking protection by actually criminally prosecuting the adults, uh, which resulted in the separation from them of their children. It was um, first tried in a small part of Texas for several months and then rolled out nationwide um, around April, May 2018. Um, and during that period, we know that more than 5,000 children were actually taken from their parents. Although it's interesting to note that there was recently a report offered by the Department of Homeland Security's own oversight body, the, the Office of Inspector General, Generate, that said uh, the systems they used to track the family units, to track parents and the children that were separated from them, were so rudimentary and so mistake-ridden that as of today, they literally cannot determine how many children were ultimately separated from their families. So the agency that was in charge of family separation does not know how many children were separated which we know makes it very difficult to reunite people. Um, tomorrow marks the anniversary of when a federal court enjoined the zero tolerance policy. It said that the Trump administration had to stop this policy and it gave some very clear deadlines for the reuniting of children with their families. We also know from that same oversight report that uh, the Department of Homeland Security was not able to meet those deadlines because they did not know who the children were or where their parents were. In fact, as many as eight or nine months after the deadlines given by the courts, there were still children who had not been re reunited. And since we don't have final numbers, there may well be children who have not been reunited today. Now, a lot of public attention uh, really helped to get the zero tolerance policy ended and helped to put pressure on various parts of the government to stop this very blatant and public way of uh, separating families. But what continued after that court order is perhaps less known. Um, the court order left some vague uh, elements that could, could be interpreted in broad ways, left some discretion for the Customs and Border Protection's officers to make decisions on the fly about if it were appropriate to separate a child from its parent. And so well after the zero tolerance policy was stopped, we had at least another thousand, maybe 1,200 children that were separated at the border by the Customs and Border Protection because of there were a couple of exceptions in the, in the judgment, but the one that I think we saw the most at the Young Center was uh, parents who had some sort of alleged criminal history or alleged criminal conviction. And what's interesting is that while in the domestic child welfare context, those criminal convictions or allegations would have to have some bearing on a parent's ability to care for their child, uh, in the case of immigrant children, um, Customs and Border Protection was authorized to make those separations even if the criminal um, allegation had nothing to do 
with a parent's ability to care for their child. And those cases are something that we have uh, lawyers on the panel who have worked on as well as other cases. We'll hear a little bit more about how challenging that work is. And then there is still another way that children were being separated from their parents and continue today to, to some extent. Uh, the administration put in place a policy called the Migrant Protection Protocol, uh, which is ironically named as the policy forces families to wait in Mexico for their um, court hearings rather than be admitted into the United States. Uh, folks who have been stuck at the border since the program began in 2019. At one point, there were as many as 60,000 people waiting on the southern border in very um, dangerous conditions poor sanitation, not um, access to schooling or medical care, and quite a few uh, incidents of violence. And so another way that children were separated was when parents came to the border seeking protection for their children. There were many kids who um, were removed from parents when there were questions about, are you really the parent? Are you say who you say you are? Um, and then also in more recent times, uh, the reality that the conditions aren't getting better, all the court dates have been postponed, and so we have a number of parents making the torturous choice, which choice is probably not the right word, to um, send their children over the border by themselves uh, in hopes that they can protect their children while the parents wait for the hearings in Mexico, the children can be admitted to the United States and seek um, the opportunity to be reunited with aunts and uncles and grandparents who may already be in the United States. So we know from numbers we've gotten that more than 600 kids have been um, in that situation. They've been in the, the MPP program in Mexico and then um, either with their parents' knowledge or sometimes on their own, crossed over uh, the U.S. border and were admitted into um, the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement here, which takes um, takes custody of unaccompanied and separated children. So that's another way that we've seen families be torn apart by a raft of policies that really have very little bearing on what's good for people and much more what's good for politics. And now in our current moment in the global pandemic that we're all living with, we have what I would call an opportunistic policy of shutting down the border, not to everyone, but shutting down the border to people who don't have the appropriate travel documents, which almost uh, singles out asylum-seeking adults, asylum-seeking families, and unaccompanied children. So we've taken the most vulnerable parts of um, the populations that are trying to cross between countries, and we've told them, you're not welcome, you may be vectors of disease, um, we're not going to take you because of this pandemic, when really plenty of other people are flowing back and forth um, across the border. And, and we were, we're really using the moment to accomplish a goal that this administration has stated from the beginning. They want to reduce uh, the, the flow of immigrants into the United States. And here seems to be their moment. So we have at this point um, more than a thousand, maybe 2000 kids who have been uh, simply turned around at the border and returned either to Mexico or put on planes in the middle of a pandemic and flown back to their country of origin, the country which they were fleeing, with no regard to whether they'll be safe, with no regard if there's any adult to care for them, uh, with no regard for, for anything about these people. Um, it's been really quite egregious, and it's a, a policy that we're working on fighting every day, <laughs> and we're not alone. There's many who have joined in this fight, and I believe it will continue as we uh, move into the next six months and what this pandemic may bring for all of us. And we know that family separation is not unique to immigrant children. We know that in the United States, um, black children are disproportionately separated from families every day, whether it's a result of over-criminalization, over-policing in black neighborhoods, or a result of mass incarceration, which takes parents away from children every day, or a reality of racially biased uh, child welfare systems that have unfortunately um, over surveilled, over monitored, uh, and disproportionately removed children from black families, black children from black families. And so we know that while we're 
thinking about what we can do to help immigrant children who are being separated. We also have the struggle of our black brothers and sisters and other children of color um, to consider and to be allies with in the struggle to end family separation across the board. So with that in mind, I wanna turn back to the report and just give you the highlights of the six key recommendations that we have um, provided here. And you can read more about the, the kinds of cases we've seen and the kinds of um, recommendations we're proposing in the report. I believe the link is provided. Um, but let me just go quickly so that we get to our panel. Uh, first one is that every government agency must make the best interests of the child a primary consideration in every decision made about a child. Um, I know that may be surprising to some, but there's no requirement in in any immigration law, um, for the most part, that what's best for the child must be a, a big driver of decision making. And so that's our primary recommendation that children's best interests be put first. Um, the second recommendation is that Congress and agency policy must prohibit family separation in all but the most exceptional cases. And here we mean cases in which there is imminent risk of safety to the child. If there is imminent risk of safety to the child by the parent, there may be a moment that separation needs to occur. But even that, if you will turn to our third recommendation, um, must be reviewed. It must be reviewed by a court with expertise in child protection and parental rights, not immigration enforcement officials. Decisions to separate children from parents should be made by independent, culturally sensitive, trained child welfare um, and child development professionals. Our fourth recommendation is that federal agencies should ensure that every child separated from a parent has an attorney and, that, uh, and an independent child advocate. When DHS separates the child from a parent, it should be required to ensure that both the parent and the child have counsel. And for children, child advocates, which we'll talk a little bit more about on the panel. Our fifth recommendation is that Congress must protect the Flores Settlement Agreement and the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, or we call the TVPRA, both of which are critical protections for children. Before we had the Flores Settlement Agreement and the TVPRA, immigrant children were treated exactly the same as adults. And so any effort to roll these back or weaken them simply undermines the safety of children. And finally, we will reiterate our call that the executive branch end this migrant protection protocols, remain in Mexico program, and restore the right to asylum, which it has worked over time to undermine. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Noor Jahan to introduce our panelists. Thank you so much, Mary, and thank you all for being here. I just want to add that Mary, um, did not introduce uh, herself and mentioned that she primarily authored this report that we have today. Mary is our Senior Policy Analyst for Child Protection at the Young Center and we are so lucky to have her. Um, tonight, joining me if our panelists would um, turn on their videos if they have the capability, um, joining us for this conversation are Young Center Executive Director Maria Wolchen, um, Cameroon American Council CEO and founder Sylvie Bello and our Young Center New York Managing Attorney Priscilla Monica Marie. Um, we are going to have, um, I have a few questions for each of our wonderful panelists and then afterwards we're going to have some time for questions from the audience. So if you're joining us on Zoom, please um, submit your questions through the chat function that is in Zoom and if you're joining us on Facebook, you can uh, write your questions in the comment section. We will try to get to as many of those questions as possible. Um, to, think, to get things started, Maria, we heard from Mary a little bit about how the government started family separation way before they publicly announced it. Did you know in advance that the government was piloting family separation and planning to go nationwide with it? Were there clear signals that something new was taking place? And also, how has this period and immigration policy been different or the same as previous times. Okay, thanks, Nurjahan. Um, so it, back in spring of 2017, um, it was then Homeland Security Secretary Kelly um, came out and um, announced that he was considering family separation and the reason being to deter migration. 
I will admit, I was one of those people who said, no way, our government would never do that. Um, and I was very wrong. Um, and then, so in fall of 2017, we started seeing cases around the country of very, very young children being separated from their parents. Um, the Young Center has eight offices across the country, um, including an office on the border. And so we can really see patterns of cases when they start emerging. So we started seeing all these cases of, of really little kids. Um, and also seeing cases where these kids had come in at the border at El Paso um, and been children taken from their families. And we st so all of these separated kid cases uh, seem to have, the families seem to have come in at certain points around the country. Um, so we knew something was going on and we did go to the press at the time and we went to very highly respected press and the reporters were interested but their bosses said, you know, these are one-offs, this is not a policy, but, but we knew this was more than just one-off situations. Um, and there was actually one reporter, Lomi Creel in Houston, uh, the Houston Chronicle, who did um, start writing stories about this. Um, this is just one of the most awful policies that we have seen as child advocates. So our role as child advocate, um, we're attorneys and social workers, and our job is advocating for the best interests of these kids. Um, we, so we got appointed as child advocate to many of the kids who were separated from their parents, um, and it was just really difficult. Um, our staff, our volunteers met with these kids, all of whom were very traumatized from the separation. They didn't understand what had happened. In many cases, they thought their parents had abandoned them. Um, and our, our staff also took calls from the parents who were just distraught about what's happening. Um, I mean, I've been doing this work for 16 years. I will say that this is um, one of the worst things that, uh, worst policies that I have ever seen. Um, but has it, is it different? Um, you know, we have been around since President Bush. We were here for the eight years of President Obama, um, we worked hard all of that time to advocate for kids. There was, it, you know, it was never easy, um, but we had no idea how difficult it would be under the Trump administration. Um, I will say, and, and Mary mentioned this, um, it was really the public outcry that ended uh, family separation. Um, and, um, and, and it was really the public held the government accountable for this. And as Mary also said, the, the administration is still separating families um, and we really need to work to keep them accountable. Um, and so I just wanna end by saying, it's just really critical that the public keep an eye on everything that's happening and, um, and continue to speak out about this issue. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, Sylvie, I have a question for you. Could you tell us a little bit about why people are coming to the uh, United States from West Africa and in particular from Cameroon? Um, and what are some of the issues that the asylum seekers that are coming from Cameroon and making their way to the United States facing? Thank you for the question and just thank you the Young Center for having us on. Um, really, before I actually even get into that, uh, question. Um, I just want to say that um, there is, in this space um, of immigrant justice, we um, depend on, you know, specialists and experts at the Young Center. Um, I know when Jennifer puts out um, your policy director, when she puts out reports um, in the coalitions, um, we look into it because we, we, we know that we don't have the capacity to do that kind of in-depth research that the Young Center does. So it is a really, really um, honor and privilege to, to be part of this discussion um, and to lift up um, a brief history of family separation. And so, so yeah, so Cameroonians have been coming to the US for 400 years. That's how long Cameroonians have been coming to the U.S. Um, Bimbia, which is a port in, um, in Cameroon, um, it's in Limbe. Our ancestors were stolen and sold to the Americas. Um, and, um, and through 200 years, um, 
worked for free. Many of them babies, kids, you know, Frederick Douglass talks about it um, in his book, um, you know, and, and um, so family separation and Cameroonians um, are tied to the history of the United States. About Temple University says somewhere between like eight to 11% of uh, African Americans trace their ancestry to Cameroon. Um, and because we're looking into policy, I'm gonna just, you know, you know, say some policy folks like Karen Bass, who is the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, traced her DNA um, to Cameroon. Um, Cory Booker, um, Robin Kelly, the congresswoman from Illinois. Um, and um, so, so yeah, Cameroon and the United States and family separation goes all the way back to 400 years. And then when we even look at, you know, as Cameroonians um, in America, when we look, we are part of the African American narrative. Um, and when we look throughout history, right? Like if I go from the title of um, this conference, um, you know, Zoom conference, children and separating children have always been there and it has also always been the spark for movements right um when we think about you know the the slave uprising um there were many kids involved when we go further down and think about the civil rights movement we think about emmett till you know the the murder the assassination of emmett till a baby really um, you know, really sparked the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, um, you know, just ripping him apart from, from his mom, you know, um, when we go even today, when we think about how the founders of Black Lives Matter, which by the way, one of the co-founder of Black Lives Matter is an African immigrant, my colleague Opal Timenti, who um, at the time was um, working on African immigrant issues and black immigrant issues as the rector of Baji. Um, so I just wanted to put that plug that as African immigrants were so involved and connected and part of the narrative. Um, but when we think about how Opal and, and her co-founders of the Black Lives Matter movement came about, it was because of, 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 of kids who were separated of kids who were killed, right? Um, Trevor Martin, Mike Brown. Um, we go all the way to today. Today, Tamara Rice would have been part of the class of 2020, but he's not with us today. Um, and so there is a lot of connection between how babies and kids and children have been ripped apart and have sparked movement. So we are in a very interesting time. And I'm back to present day, Cameroon present day. Um, we've looked at you know, how our ancestors came from Bimbia, Gori Island in Senegal, and up and down the West Coast by, you know, I'm using, you know, were stolen from the shores of Bimbia, really. Um, so today, why are there 10,000 Cameroonians um, across the US-Mexico border? Well, the reason is simple, as a direct result of the racial reckoning we are experiencing right at this moment. Direct result. So as a direct result of American policies um, in, on the continent. Um, it's as a direct result of slavery. It's as a direct result of colonization. Cameroon has five armed conflicts. And um, one of them is called the Anglophone Crisis, right? The, you know, that particular conflict is an ex existential, ex existential crisis for Cameroon. The folks want to separate, which, you know, they want to secede. And we know, you know, what happens here um, in the United States with, with cessation and, and the war that went on. Um, thankfully, you know, the, the North one, and we can finally get rid of all the Confederate flags, I hope, soon. Um, so it's as a direct result because we just celebrated Juneteenth. So 200 plus years after our ancestors 
were stolen from the shores of Bimbia, Cameroon. Juneteenth, they were free-ish, right? Because we know we're still in balls and chains today. That's why there's a reckoning right now. When that happened, the European oppressors just turned around and colonized us on the continent, right? They enslaved us on the continent. That's how my last name is Bello, my father's, and I'm an immigrant, right? So, and, and so that continued for decades. And also in 1960, Cameroon had its independence and it was free-ish and post-colonization continued with the oppression. That is why we have Cameroonian escaping five armed conflicts, going to Ecuador where they have a free visa, um, trekking eight countries from Ecuador to Mexico, getting to Mexico, ex not just in Mexico, but throughout that journey and experiencing anti-Blackness, anti-Africanness, and quite frankly, anti-Cameroonianness get to the border and cross seeking asylum, right? Because there are five armed conflicts, but no, they're put in cages just like their ancestors before them um, and, um, and refused, uh, you know, the liberties that America, quite frankly, should be upholding. Um, and the rights of America, quite frankly, should be upholding. When uh, Maria talks about, you know, she was shocked that the government would actually do harm. As a Black person, I am not shocked that the United States government will do harm. We have 400 years of Cameroonians, right, from Bimbia to today, um, you know, being harmed. So, so yeah, so on Juneteenth, like their ancestors before them, 40 Cameroonian, Juneteenth 2020 now, on Juneteenth 2020, like their ancestors before them, 40 Cameroonian men at Pine Perry invoked their ancestors, Pine Perry, Louisiana, and sought out and, and asked for freedom and protested. Some of you may have seen um, that viral Twitter that went off on Joe. Uh, Penny's um, page, or if you go to our page at Cameroon American Council. So yes, that is the reason why 400 years of Cameroonians stolen till today, um, and the same thing happens, they're in cages. Thank you. And we need that to stop. And, um, and I'm really, really happy that the report that's coming out, we can all, you know, parse it out and see how it affects all children, but especially the, the, the family separation of these men for Pine Perry, for instance, a lot of them are fathers. One of them is 60 years old. Um, so, you know, they, they protested on Juneteenth, which was Friday. Sunday was Father's Day. They are separated. A lot of them have um, uh, 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 relatives and spouses and kids in other detention centers. Their, a lot of their kids are in adult detention centers because, as you know, you know, black men are never allowed, um, you know, a childhood, right? Look at Tamir Rice again. I'm going to go to Tamir Rice, right? Um, so, so we have the same family separation issues um, that have affected our community and our ancestry and our forefathers and foremothers for 400 years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvie, for that. We really appreciate having you on the panel. And also, um, your work is so grounded on working directly with the migrants who are at the border. So we really appreciate that perspective. Um, Priscilla, you are one of the two young center attorneys who were assigned specifically to work on family separations in 2018 um, because of uh, funding from private foundations and donors who supported our work. Some of the cases you and your colleagues worked on are actually profiled in the report that came out today. Today, you co-supervise our entire New York office with a team of attorneys and social workers who work on a variety of cases. How do you see family separation uh, taking place today? And in the cases that you, so, uh, you supervise um, at the Young Center? Thank you, Noor Jahan, for the question. And uh, thank you to the Young Center for the opportunity to uh, talk about this really important issue this evening. Family separation is very much uh, an ongoing issue, though it may not be 
in the media as it was in the summer of 2018, we continue to see family separation every day in the work that we do. And I like to think of family separation right now as happening in four distinct buckets or four distinct categories of cases. The first is family separation for non-biological parents. In other words, primary caretakers that are outside of the court case that made it um, illegal to separate children from their biological parents. So in that case, a separation might be separation from an adoptive parent, from a primary caretaker, a grandmother, or an aunt. And in many cases, these primary caretakers are the sole caretakers of their children, either because their parents were uh, victims of a crime or they may be deceased or there are other extenuating circumstances. That's the first bucket. The second is separation due to um, minor criminal history, criminal history that poses no risk to the child. And some examples of that might be separation on the basis of a DWI from over a decade ago, or separation based upon a bond in home country that wasn't paid from for a crime that occurred 10 to 15 years ago. We continue to see separations like that. There are separations due to parents being charged criminally. Um, and this is something that we've continued to see even into uh, last year and in, in, into the fall and into the winter. And, and even now, uh, when we, we continue to work with families where this is the case. Many times these are cases where we have adoptive parents or other primary caretakers uh, that are being charged for smuggling their own children into the country. So they are charged criminally with alien smuggling um, for having entered the country with their own adopted child. Or they're charged with uh, criminally making false statements, statements such as, I'm the parent of this child. And because the child is not biologically related to the parent, uh, they are then prosecuted federally for that quote unquote crime. And the last category of separations that we continue today to see today is separations um, because of the conditions in the MPP program. Right now, the Remain in Mexico program puts families and children in such dire circumstances that in order to keep children safe, parents are forced to send their children over on their own. As an example, I can think of a dad who crossed over the border a number of times because he had an infant baby and didn't have enough formula or diapers for that child. I can think of a mom who had a five-year-old son who was followed by the local cartel in Mexico and who fled but unfortunately that evening their refugee camp was attacked by the local cartel. And because of that, mom sent the kid over out of safety, out of desperation. So those, those continue to be government forced separations. So to recap, it's separation based on a familiar relationship that's not a biological parent, separation based on criminal history that's very minor and poses no uh, risk to the child separation because the parent is being charged criminally for a crime such as alien smuggling or for making false statements for indicating that their adopted child is their child. And lastly, separation that's, that's a result of this Remain in Mexico program where families are living in dire circumstances and are forced to do so. Thank you so much, Priscilla, for the examples you provided. Um, Maria, my next question is for you. The Young Center has a unique model. For more than 16 years, the organization has been working with some of the most vulnerable immigrant children in government care. My question is that, my guess is that very few people know that the Young Center was probably one of the only organizations that didn't have to substantially adapt its model in order to to meet the needs of the family separation crisis. Um, well, definitely there was a surge in cases and all our offices had more work than ever before. The Young Center has been entrenched in family separation work since you, you founded it. Can you help us understand what a child advocate is and why the role of a child advocate was particularly critical during the zero tolerance policy. Sure, thanks Narjahan. So um, our job as child advocate is to advocate for the best interests of the child. And really best interest means safety 
and well-being. So our organization is comprised of attorneys and social workers um, and we work with bilingual volunteers um, who are and we're appointed by the Department of Health and Human Services as child advocate for individual kids. So our volunteers actually go into the facilities where kids are in custody and just very briefly, you know, kids are typically apprehended at the border um, by uh, homeland and security and then they're transferred to the custody of Office of Refugee Resettlement and placed in shelter facilities around the country and we have offices in eight of those places. Um, and so our volunteers go into the facilities to meet with the kids um, and they go there to spend time. They do not go in with a questionnaire. They spend time with the kids and their job is really to get to know the kids to learn their stories um, and to learn what those kids want. And oftentimes their stories hold the key to whether they might be eligible for some sort of protection. And then with that information, our attorneys and social workers fight for these kids on in all, all arenas. So we fight for safe placement, um, release from custody, family reunification, make sure they have an attorney because even though we are attorneys, we're not their direct legal representatives. Um, figuring out if they have legal relief and then arguing for that legal relief to be presented and then where it's applicable, um, whether it's against a child's best interest to be repatriated. Um, in many cases, our job is to remind all of these decision makers that these are kids because the problem is that we're in a system that treats children like adults. Um, my background was in child welfare and juvenile justice, and I remember just, again, being shocked at the system that had no best interest standard, no separate system for kids, um, kids in court with adults, judges reading the same um, materials to kids, warnings to kids that they read to adults. Um, so it's a really difficult um, system for kids, and we remind everyone that these are children. Um, we make arguments based on best interest law, state best interest law, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child, because we still do not have a federal statute that mandates consideration of best interest. So, you know, our role is to get to know the kids, learn what they want, um, and we're determined not to take a paternalistic view. Um, we do not oppose what children want against um, unless their safety is at risk because really these kids are in a system where everyone is adversarial against them. So um, we are really allies to these kids. Um, so with respect to family separation, I mean, clearly, you know, it was really simple. It was never in the best interest of these children to be separated from their families. Um, and yes, Nur Jahan, we have seen these cases since the beginning. Um, I remember very early on having a case where um, a mom, a child was taken from a mom in family detention because the mom was depressed. And I mean, it, absolutely ridiculous. You would never do that in our child welfare system. Um, another case where a boy was who was deaf was separated from his older brother. Um, his older brother was the only person who could communicate with him because he didn't speak a traditional sign language, but his brother understood him and they were separated. So we have always worked on these cases and fought for um, reunification of these kids. Um, so we knew how to you know, go about finding parents, um, advocating with the shelters where the kids are in custody and with the adult facilities to allow them to communicate. And oftentimes for these kids, um, it was the first time that they had been able to see their parents. Um, and again, you know, as I said earlier, a lot of times these kids thought their parents abandoned them. So seeing their parents, being able to talk to them was just so, so important for them and also important for the kids. Um, we work to get parents out of detention. So our job is writing best interest recommendations. These are law-based recommendations that we submit to immigration judges, asylum officers, um, enforcement officials, Office of Refugee Resettlement. And so we took those best interest recommendations and submitted them to the judges making decisions about the parents. But making the argument that it, it is in this child's best interest that you judge release this father because this child is being traumatized because 
he's separated from the father. And these judges accepted these best interest recommendations. And in many cases, we were successful at getting the parents out. And then we worked to get the kids out of custody. Um, and so really, I mean, it's, you know, it's figuring out what the parents wanted for these kids. We also had cases where parents were deported and the children remained behind. And we do work um, internationally. We work with social workers in other countries to um, help track down information. And so we were able to use those networks of social workers to find the parents, to figure out what the parents wanted for the, their kids, and then you know, work to, to make that happen. Um, and there certainly were difficult situations where the parents were returned to danger. And there you know, were really hard, agonizing decisions for those parents as to whether they wanted, what they wanted for their kids. So, I mean, our role, um, you know, these family separation uh, situations were not just about getting legal relief for the kids. Um, they were about figuring out what was best for the kids and then fighting throughout the system with all of the different stakeholders to make that happen. Thank you so much, Maria. I have a question for you, Sylvie. Um, given your experience, what are some of the additional hurdles and some of the forms of discrimination that Black immigrants face in the legal process? What have you observed while working in this space? Nora John, thank you. Um, that question really is so critical because every discrimination that um, happens within um, any of the borders, um, be it north or south, or you know the airports and whatnot, affects Black immigrants. So, so all the um, all the atrocities that the government is doing, not protecting, um, you know, the different human rights that should be protected for asylum seekers, for immigrants, affects us. Now <clears throat> we have an extra um, layer, right? Um, just having a black body, just understanding how um, white supremacy works, right, throughout the ages um, makes us as black immigrants um, greater targets um, within the immigration system and also more vulnerable um, outside of the immigration system. Um, th that's the reason why, you know, our colleagues at Baji had a report about, you know, that African uh, well, black immigrants in general, you know, we make up um, very uh, small percentage of the general immigrant population, yet very significant in deportation. Even right now with COVID-19, you know, Haitians are, Haitian uh, uh, immigrants are being deported significantly more than, I don't know, folks from Ireland, right? Um, so racism is very, very prevalent everywhere. It's systemic everywhere, um, but also in immigration. And this doesn't, I'm just going to put it out that this doesn't limit itself just to the, like when I say the system, it's everything, you know, from the federal, um, uh, from the appeals, the, the immigration appeals, well, if it's starting with the immigration judges, you know, to um, the ICE officials, and sometimes even the social justice NGOs, right? Because sometimes there is bias that we may not even know, which is why I am really um, impressed by the many um, immigrant justice organizations who have stepped up um, in this moment um, and probably have been doing the work all along, but have significantly stepped up in this moment to release um, statements on on um, and how on how they're tackling you know uh, uh, racial bias and how they're tackling um, racism in, in, within their own institution. Um, you know this call is is reflective of of that as well. Um, so the racial bias, the racism, like the blatant racism, is in every aspect of the of the of the system. Let me let's take Cameroonians for instance. When we come to Ecuador. And one of the reasons why the, the Cameroonians go to Ecuador is because, you know, there was a time when um, a lot of the Latin American countries and the, the 
the Central American, South American countries, um, the Caribbean countries, were doing the South-South collaboration, like, hey, let's get together, let's reduce barriers for trade, for transportation, for travel, business, and um, provided a lot of uh, visa-free or, or, or very low uh, barriers to, to visa. So a lot of Cameroonians escaping um, the five armed conflicts, including Boko Haram in the north of Cameroon, including um, the Anglophone crisis um, in, the, in the west of Cameroon, um, would go to Ecuador and trek. Now, when our ancestors were stolen from Bimbia, Cameroon, and other parts of West Africa, they were sold throughout the Americas. So the anti-Blackness doesn't just start, you know, here. You know, it starts once we get to Ecuador um, and, and start crossing through because a lot of the, 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 the eight countries, a lot of the, the, the countries have not, um, like there's white supremacist uh, views, there is racial bias, there is um, um, anti-Blackness. And so they experience that along the way when they get, and the, and the most prevalent part, like even along the way with human trafficking, right? Because every time we talk about family separation, there's always aspects of human trafficking. Even with the human traffickers, right? Um, the, the, you know, we're told that some of them, you know, they, they even have, you know, they say there's a code among thieves. Some of them will say, nah, 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 nah. Even for us, we're, we're not going to take you, you know, you Africans, where do you think you're going, right? They, like, you know, so they would even, like, like even the human traffickers, when you're going to think, yeah, they're going to think, oh, yeah, the color is all green, right? Whatever you're paying them, no. So they would actually even refuse, you know, to, to show the route, you know, and, and things like that. So... So the racism, the racial bias um, starts, at least for the Cameroonians, from there as they're crossing the country. It gets worse as, it, as they're coming further north because they're not spending a lot of time in, in some of the countries they're crossing. Now, when they get to Tapachula, last year, Cameroonians... Um, made a little bit of splash, splash because there was um, riots at Tapachula, uh, which is the southern, is one of the southern towns in, in Mexico, the border towns before, you know, in, in Mexico. And when they got there, they would let every, the Mexican government, right, would let everyone go through and not the Cameroonians, right? Um, and um, they would be there for months and months because they needed some kind of paperwork um, you know, to cross to, to the north of Mexico before, you know, eventually coming to the United States, uh, which they really should be coming to the United States, especially when the United States, you know, stole our ancestors from Bimbia 400 years ago. Um, so as they're making their way to the United States, the Mexican government will say, no, 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 you, you, you stay here. And so the Cameroonians rioted. You know, if folks look up, you know, Cameroonians and Tapachula, right, you see, and it was a direct result of racism. They would let every, you know, when the caravans would come through, they would let them through. When, when other um, groups of, of, of um, migrants would come through, they would let them through. But when the black migrants would come through, they would say no. And this actually even sometimes included the Garofinas of Honduras and other Afro, um, uh, other Afro brothers and sisters from, from other parts. Now, the Cameroonians protested. That's why I, earlier I mentioned that there is an anti cameroonianness The Cameroonians protested and, the, and it made a splash, you know, New York Times, you know, a bunch of different media covered it. And the Mexican government finally said, you know what, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna release some of these black people. But you Cameroonians, we're not gonna release you. So when the news starts seeing, you know, you know black bodies moving, they don't know if they're Haitians or Congolese or Cameroonians, but because the, that, that protest was led by Cameroonians, right? And a lot of them are the same men who are at Pine Perry who, who protested for Juneteenth, right? So when they led that protest, they retaliated against them. They let other uh, uh, black migrants through and kept the Cameroonians even longer, right? And then when we, you finally cross, you get up to to um, Tijuana, which is uh, the, the the northernmost uh, part of of Mexico, to to the American southern border, and, and on that side of this of the American southern border is San Diego County in California, on the California side. When the Cameroonians get there, same thing with the metering, 
right? Um, amazingly, you know, Cameroonians will be there for months. Other nationals will just cross through a week, couple of days, couple of hours, and they will just cross through, right? Because they, they, they have certain priv uh, privileges, right? They, they may speak Spanish better. They may look the part. Um, uh, they may be closer to whiteness because that's how white supremacy works, right? Um, and the Cameroonians there protested as well. So if folks look up, you know, Tijuana Cameroon protest, they would um, see that. Um, they, you know, they, they, they would see that. So the, the, the racism and the barriers starts for, I would say for the Cameroonians throughout their journey from the South, from the eight countries that crossed it to get here. And then when they get here, you have um, Cameroonian women who protested in March during Women History Month in Texas, a detention center called Don Huto, 150 of them or so, you know, protested and were met with retaliation. Um, they, they were um, sent out to other detention centers. They, they uh, uh, were put in solitary confinement. How dare you protest, you know, um, and, 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 and the Pine Perry Juneteenth protesters, this was not their first um, go around. They had protested uh, during Black History Month in February. They protested racist judges, right? They protested um, just a racist process. They protested the fact that they could not understand, like, you know, if folks have seen the, the, their video, if you go to Joe Penny's um, YouTube um, uh, channel, you know, if you see their video, they protested the fact that even amongst us as social justice organizations, they're not getting the same services, right? They are always getting the highest bonds. We right now have three Cameroonians with $50,000 bonds, right? I mean, if, you know, reparation is being paid, you know, why would Cameroonians have $50,000 bond? Because when they're fleeing crisis, that stems from slavery and colonization, right? Um, so, so when you think about other holocausts that happen, when you think about other genocides that happen in history, and you think about the immigration relief that they got, right? If you think about World War II and after World War II with the Marshall Plan and the kinds of immigration relief that these um, migrants from Europe got, that's not the kind of immigration relief black immigrants are getting, right? Um, when you think about, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the Irish migrants, when you think about other migrants, you know, and the kinds of immigration relief they had after genocides in their countries, after Holocaust in their country, that is not the kind of relief Cameroonians and others are getting. So the discrimination starts with the policies even, right? When you think about the fact that the diversity visa, which is one of the ways in which Cameroonians and other Africans over 50 countries in Africa get their papers in the United States. It's, 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 you know, President Trump just cut it out. You know, that is not the kinds of immigration relief that America has shown to other countries throughout history that have gone through slavery, colonization, and other forms of Holocaust and genocide. That's just not it. So yes, um, Black immigrants face all kinds of challenges that stem all the way to slavery. Think about Marcus Garvey, right? He was born in um, Jamaica and came to the United States and was expelled. Think about Kwame uh, um, uh, Toure, you know, Saki Carmichael. He was born in, in, in uh, Trinidad, you know, the Black Panther leader, came to the United States and was expelled. You know, so there is a significant difference which is why this moment in which we're in, this racial reckoning, um, resonating that Black Lives Matter in detention too, and Black Lives Matter with undocumented migrants, Black Lives Matter with DACA, you know, Black DACA migrants. Um, so yeah, we need a lot of work to be done. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you so, so much, Sylvie. I just want to remind everyone that we are a little bit short on time, so I might have to rush us all a little bit. Thank you for being patient with me. Um, Priscilla, I have a, a final question for you, and then I have a question from the audience as well. Um, a report from Physicians for Human Rights said, uh, showed that um, uh, family separation under this administration can be 
classified as torture. We all have a little bit of an understanding of what childhood trauma or attachment issues or regression looks like, but you probably see it uh, in your work every day. Could you tell us a little bit about the impact of family separation on children and um, does your, your previous experience and disability rights inform your work now with separated kids? Thanks, Noor Jahan, for the question. So um, the trauma that we've observed due to family separation, not even just parent separation, but family separation is truly unspeakable. Um, as an example, I witnessed the reunification of a six-year-old boy with his uh, father after having been separated for six months. And this little boy was screaming at the top of his lungs, no, 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 because his father was to him a stranger and he had developed such an unhealthy attachment to his uh, temporary caretakers that he was afraid to go back to someone that was his primary caretaker prior to coming to the US. And having to witness not just the trauma to the child, but also the trauma to the parent as he sat there sobbing because his child no longer had that connection with him, no longer wanted to be with his father. That was a very, very difficult experience for me and something difficult that we witnessed as we witnessed these traumas happen in day, day in and day out. And from the disability or the developmental perspective, what I will say is that these family separations leave children with regressions and, and delays that they didn't previously have. And this means milestones that were previously set are suddenly lost. Children that were pre previously speaking are no longer speaking. Children are suddenly soiling their clothes when they were already pottered, potty trained. Children have trouble sleeping uh, when they were already sleeping through the night. The impact from the developmental standpoint is truly terrifying. And again, I want to just emphasize that this, this damage is not just from parent-child separation, but it's separated, being separated from your primary caretaker, whether that's your aunt, your grandmother, your adoptive parent, or your biological parent. And it is, it is very difficult to witness. Thank you so much, Priscilla. Thank you all so much for making time for this conversation. And I know it's nighttime and some people probably haven't had dinner. Um, thank you, Maria. Sylvia, Sylvie, Priscilla, all of you for answering um, and being on our panel, we really, really appreciate it. Um, I know that we have at, at least a, a few questions from the audience, but I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them um, now. So um, what we will do is we will respond to your questions in email form. Uh, we will just write out your answers and send them to you. Um, I hope that that will be good. Um, I also want to say um, a big thanks to everybody who made this report possible, um, for everybody who donates and supports our work. We are especially thankful to the Colony Foundation for Justice, to the Landry Charitable Fund, um, to the Bay and Paul Foundations, to the Together Rising Community, to Michael Becker, T. Uh, Scott to reach you and to all of the supporters of our 2018 New York benefit, you all provided funding for our work to, um, for our staff to work exclusively on parent-child separation cases when we needed it most at the height of the crisis and that was invaluable. Thank you all so much, um, every one of you who supports our work, we're so grateful. And for our panelists, please don't um, leave yet, I have one more question for all three of you, um, which is what keeps you do doing this work um, every day and what gives you hope? No, Jahan, do you want me? Yes, no, <laughs> okay. I mean, I think what keeps me doing this work is um, the children that we have the honor of serving and meeting these kids and, and learning their stories. And, and it's being able to succeed um, in getting them what they want and honoring their wishes um, about what they want. And then what gives me hope right now is seeing all the young people in the world uh, leading the way to make change. Um, that DACA decision last week gave me enormous hope. And yes, I know this administration is going to fight against it. And I know that DACA is imperfect, but um, really for many DACA recipients, for families with relatives who have DACA, for, with friends with DACA, it, it was and it still is a cause for celebration. But the thing I think that's most important is this was a youth-led movement. Um, and I've taken heart from seeing so many young people standing up for what's right in the last month to six weeks. And um, I will say it gives me hope 
and it also gives me comfort. What gives me hope? I would say my ancestors. Um, when I think about uh, abolitionists of the past, you know, Maryland, Harriet Tubman, um, Sojourner Truth. Um, when I think about um, kids who were turned into math hires and and um, spurred movements. Um, when I think about um, the, the families we serve, when I think about um, you know, the, the kids right now who are Cameroonian, who are um, in Mexico caught up in this COVID-19 and are not um, able to fully be kids, you know, because of 400 years of oppression that have led to wars. Um, what gives me hope is, um, is the Young Center, really. Um, just this week, we had reached out to Jennifer, um, you know, your policy director, to tell her about a case. Um, we lost um, a, a baby um, in, in, in Mexico um, in this pandemic, and um, we were really, really confused. And, um, and you know, she was able to help us, provide us with all kinds of different resources. So our partners give us hope. So thank you. I think for me, what gives me hope and what keeps me going is the resilience of the children and the family who come to the U.S. every day seeking safety. Frankly, if they can overcome violence and persecution in their home country, the arduous journey to get to the United States, the utter desperation of the MPP camps, and frankly, the pain of not knowing whether or not they will be able to ultimately be safe, all of that for the possibility of a better life here in the U.S. And frankly, if they can do all that, the least that I can do is be by their side, honor their story, and fight the fight with them. And they're the ones that give me hope. Thank you so much, Priscilla, and thank you all so much for your thoughtful questions, um, for, for just being part of tonight. We really, really appreciate it. And once again, you can find uh, the report. We sent it here on Zoom to those who are, who are attending via Zoom. And we have also um, share, shared it on Facebook in the comments section under this live video. So um, feel free to, to get it from there, download it and read it and share feedback if you have any and uplift it with your communities and with your people. We need your voices um, to keep this work going. Thank you all so much. Have a great evening.